Never had a lot growing up, but we had lots of love as kids. My dad never laid a finger on any of us. Um, but we had lots of love. I was kissing my dad at 15, good night, you know, before I went to bed. So we had lots of love and uh, we were always very clean, but not a lot of money. And when I was 16, I got a really op good opportunity to go to Luton to start an apprenticeship. And um, after a year of my apprenticeship, I was in the first team. And I was making quite a big impression on the world of football. Young lad in the first team. At 17 years of age, I made my debut against Brian Clough's Nottingham Forest. I actually scored in the game, but we lost 2-1. I spent two years uh, in the first team at Luton, played nearly 60 something games and then uh, I had an opportunity to go to Arsenal. As I said, I was making quite a big impression, several clubs wanted my signature and at 19 I became Britain's most expensive teenager in the history of football. I moved to Arsenal for £2.5 million at 19. But I have to say, when I went to Arsenal, I was slightly disappointed because Tony Adams, the day I signed, came out and admitted he's an alcoholic yeah. and Paul Merson had just booked himself into a priory. <laughs> so I thought, what the fuck am I coming for? <laughs> I'd missed all the fun. <laughs> I get it, mate. The highlight of my career at Arsenal was playing in two European finals, the Super Cup final against AC Milan and obviously the Cup Winners Cup final against Real Zaragoza in Paris. So they were probably my highlights, but Arsenal was a great experience for me. I was just 19 years of age and when I went into that dressing room, I was literally playing with the England back four. It was Seaman, Dixon, Wright, sorry, Dixon, Adams, Keel. Winterburn, see when you go. And George Graham said to me, he says, John, if you sign for me today, he says, you will play on Saturday with the England centre forward out there on Highbury. So you can imagine the excitement of a 19-year-old playing with Ian Wright, who was a wonderful centre forward at Highbury. Yeah. So they were good times for me at Arsenal. And because I was so, so young, it really, really um, stood me in good stead for the rest of my life. You know, playing with senior pros, good leaders, proper professionals. And for the rest of my career, the next 15 years, I took something from Arsenal, the fact that I was so young. From Arsenal, I went to West Ham for £3.2 million. When I signed for West Ham, I met Harry Redknapp in a, in a Waltham store hotel. And Harry spent the first 45 minutes trying to get me to buy a Greyhound <laughs> with Harry before he offered me a four-year contract. And I know what everybody's thinking. I only thinking about Al Bergovic. Hey, West Ham, Al Bergovic. I have to say, nobody wants to talk about my 40 goals in 61 games. And now I kept West Ham up single-handedly on my own. <laughs> Everybody wants to talk about Albergovic. And I did regret the Albergovic incident for about 10 minutes and I wish I could kick him out. Go on, Axel! I went on, I played 70-something games for West Ham. West Ham was a great club, a real good um, East London club, you know, proper people, East End of London, lovely football, and I had two great years there, scored a lot of goals. Uh, I was one short of Andy Cole for the Premier League's Golden Boot. Andy got 25, I got 24 that year, and I missed about seven games through suspension, but there you go. <laughs> um, from West Ham, I went to Wimbledon for a remarkable £7.5 million. I skinned it plenty of clubs in my life, but I totally fucking skinned it with <laughs> When I went to Wimbledon, it was just bonkers. <laughs> they weren't called the crazy gang for nothing, right? I played with great characters, and one of the characters I played was Vinnie Jones. Hey, hey. Now, 
we had a game one day and we playing choking ears in the dressing room. So we said to Vinny Jones, he says, Vinny he says we've got a right fucking tough game today. So Vinny's there fucking showing his tattoos, pulling up his sleeves, fucking veins coming out of his neck. So choking ears turned on to Vinny Jones, he says, Vinny he says we're playing Liverpool today. So Vinny's like, yeah, 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 boss. He said, I want you to mark Steve McMahon. So Vinny turned around and he said, what, for life or just the game? <laughs> <laughs> we used to practice getting around the referee on a Friday in training. <laughs> Honest to God, Joe Keneal would blow his whistle and he'd say to us, I want everybody to fucking get over to me. Grab hold of me, grab me by the fucking throat with the angriest of faces. Pinch me under the arms. Our goalkeeper, Neil Sullivan, had to run fucking 80 yards <laughs> to get involved in it. But it works. It works. It makes a difference if you're out there and there's a penalty appeal and fucking three arms go up. Penalty. <laughs> Referee just goes, play on the mill. A fucking 11 lunatics <laughs> surround him, threaten him. He says, fuck it, penalty. <laughs> he shoots himself. He does. <laughs> From Wimbledon, I had a great move. I went to Coventry in between my next move. And uh, Gordon Strachan signed me at Coventry. And Gordon's a great character. Very dry with the press. Remember a press man coming on to Gordon once. We lost 3-0. And we were getting relegated. And this press man, young lad he was, said to Gordon Strack and he said, Gordon, where did it all go wrong today? So Gordon Strack and looked at him and he went, somewhere out there on that big green pitch. <laughs> <laughs> he hated the press, no explanation, that's just the way he was. From Coventry, I went um, to Celtic for £6 million. Pounds. A wonderful club, really, really is. Um, the support at Celtic is like nothing else. I can't go anywhere today, whether it's Swansea, London, Cardiff, fucking Dubai, <laughs> anywhere without bumping into a Celtic fan. They are worldwide massive. In my opinion, the second behind Manchester United in world football. The fans, in my opinion, game is a lot of opinions, but I've been playing there for five seasons. They really, really are. And a couple of stories about Celtic was, I was normally brought off after about 65, 70 minutes. I don't know why, but the gaffer just used to bring me off. <laughs> Couldn't fucking last the game, might have something. <laughs> This one particular game is the semi-final of the Scottish Cup final. Sorry, semi-final of the Scottish Cup. It's at Hampden Park, which is the big national stadium in Scotland. Very similar to what they do in the FA Cup. They used to do it. They used to have the two semi-finals at Wembley, which personally I don't think is right. I think the Cup final should be played and we should all go to the Cup final and use the one stadium. I look forward to getting to Wembley. We have played Dundee United. And in the 78th minute, I've made the goal. It's 0-0, no -no. it's quite a tight game. We're playing Dundee United. The ball's come into me. I've held about fucking seven defenders off. <laughs> I've laid it to the side, and Sean Maloney has gone through and scored. He made it 1-0. So I'm running back to the halfway line. And the Dundee United kicked off. And I'm looking over to the side. And I can see number 10 going up. It's the 78th minute. Now, I'm fucking raging. I cannot believe Martin O'Neill has the audacity to bring me off. He's a manager. <laughs> so, I'm coming off at Hamden Park, and I know Martin. What he doesn't like is, he doesn't like players walking straight down the tunnel. He hates it. He likes to come up to you, give you your jacket, shake your hand, and tap you on the back as if he's made a good decision. <laughs> now I am absolutely fuming. <laughs> and I had a little bit of a temper back then. I've cursed.
moved it slightly these days. <laughs> so I've walked past and Martin so sort of come down and met me and he's come in the the, the jacket to sit on the bench and I've gone back off. <laughs> and I've walked straight down the tire. And Martin, you don't speak to Martin any other, which I was to learn after you. So I go to the dressing room at Hamden Park. There was a plate of sandwiches there. Tuna mayonnaise, tomato and salad, I think egg mayonnaise. And I've just picked the tomato, I've picked up this plate of sandwiches and I've just gone fucking water against the wall. Next plate of sandwiches, I've picked up and gone fucking water. Picked up a bottle of water and got fucking smash, smash all on the dresser. I've lost, lost the place to get all together. I'm fucking raging. I can't believe he's broke me off. I've just made the call. So Molly comes in at the end of the game with the rest of the team and they're all giving it high fives. They just got to a cup final, you know, they're just giving it well, lads, and buzzing and all that. And by now, there's fucking two remaining names and tomato. <laughs> all over Henry Glasson's suit. <laughs> Chris Sutton's got a brand new pair of shoes and there's a big fucking slice of egg in his <laughs> shoes. So man is looking around and he thinks, fuck So he said to me in the corner, sulking like a big baby, he says, John, he said, what the fuck's wrong with you? So me, like a spot brat, I stood up and I says, Gaffer, I said, what the fuck do you bring me off for? And by now, the room, the dressing room is just totally quiet. He said, listen, John, this is how Martin speaks to his players. He says, listen, John, he says, in this game that we all like to call football, how hard it is, he said, every now and again, in this wonderful game we all call football, you have to be able to run around a little bit. <laughs> He said, and in the 17th minute tonight, he says, son, you just weren't fucking running around. <laughs> so I brought you off. So that was that one. But that last morning, and uh, great club Celtic, I won four titles in five years, played in the Champions League, you know, played in big, big old firm against Rangers, big derbies. Um, and it was a great, great choice of move for me. You know, I became a winner when I got there. I was... I was privileged to play in front of that crowd, 60,000 every week, scoring goals against fucking pub teams, being idolized, <laughs> being absolutely idolized, scoring against pub My granny, I scored 110 goals for Salik, my granny could have scored 85 and 100. <laughs> she could have, but that's the truth. Because when you're at Salik, you get all of what, you're playing with 11 internationals, and I sent it forward. In my opinion, you should get goals because you get enough chances. But all through my career, um, I played for my country, obviously Wales. And playing for Wales for me uh, was the pinnacle. It's the highest achievement anybody can do, in my opinion, is to represent your country at senior level. It meant everything to me, playing for my country. Standing at the Millennium Stadium with the anthem. I looked forward to the fucking anthem more than the game. <laughs> Standing at the Millennium Stadium, looking up, seeing my parents, 72,000 people. It's what stuff of dreams are made of. As a kid growing up, kicking the ball against the, the, the wall outside your house, running around the council estate, keeping the ball up, up to no good, this, that and the other. It's what you dream of as a young kid. So for me to have worn that number nine shirt for 10 years, untouched, and to replace the likes of Trevor Ford, John Charles, Rush, Hughes, was the best for me. It meant the world. But while I'm playing for Wales, I played again with some great players, good characters. One of them characters was Craig Bellamy. Hey. Now Craig would cause a fight in a fucking empty room. True, <laughs> true. He really would. True. And everything Craig does, right, he says DK. Fucking DK. So if he hits a cross field ball, he says DK. If I get up and win a header and knock it down, he says, oh, DK, big fella. So I've had Craig now, I, I, I played for Coventry with him. He came on Lord at Celtic and I played with him with the national team for 10 years. 
So one day after training, I thought, well, I've had this for 10 years now. Fucking DK, 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 DK. Now, he's not the sharpest tool in the box, right? <laughs> not the brightest of characters, right? So I thought, I'm going to ask him now, what does this fucking DK mean? So I got on the bus after training one day. Remember, he's not the sharpest tool in the box, Craig. Huh? So I said, Bellas, this is Craig. I said, look, mate, I've been playing you for a long time. I said, well, what does DK mean? He turned around and he went, different class, Johnny White, different class. <laughs> <laughs>